everybody. It's Lindsay, your host of The Agronomists. Um, glad to be back after a week away. I've missed the show for sure. And uh, hey, super excited. Tonight's episode is all about forage agronomy, which is super cool. We are having a slight hiccup with our technology. For whatever reason, I can't see your comments. So tonight is the night. If you want to absolutely chirp me, do it now because I can't see it and you, I can't respond. Nothing. Uh, but Jay is going to, going to send the questions. Um, and before I bring in my guests, I do want to, of course, remind everybody for watching tonight's program. Uh, you do qualify for CEU credits. Head on over tomorrow morning, realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Um, make sure you sign up for those credits. You have about a month to let us know. Um, and claim those. Okay, so uh, tonight's guests. Um, yeah, thanks, Ray. You go ahead. You can make fun of me. I'm going to talk about sheep. You can make fun of that too. All right, so tonight's guests, we're going to change up uh, Peter Wheatgrass Johnson instead of Wheat Heat Johnson. And I've got Christine O'Reilly here from Omafra. Bring them on in. There we go. What do you think, Pete? Are you going to change your handle? Oh, Lord, help us. <laughs> <laughs> Wheatgrass. <laughs> oh, Wheatgrass. yeah, that's a, quite a step down, I just want to say. But anyway, well, whatever works. Anyway. Whatever works. <laughs> yeah. All right. Christine, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Lindsay? Well, I'm I'm doing all right. Um, I do want to... Uh, I've got, of course, clips for tonight. We've got all sorts of nutrient stuff we want to talk about. But I we have to start with this frost discussion, unfortunately. I think we just have to. So... Should I be, okay, my question, personally, we put millet in. We were, for the first time in probably Chris's entire farming career, he was early with something. And put millet in, it's in like maybe the two-leaf stage. We got two days, two nights of frost. How bad is it, Christine? Let's start with you and then Pete can tell me to go reseed On it. On the millet? Oh, uh, yeah. you might want to reseed that. <laughs> <laughs> no, check, check it in a couple of days. That's the first thing with frost is yeah. that we probably don't see the damage for at least a few days. So don't write anything off just yet. Uh, but millet is a warm season annual. They're really not frost tolerant at all. So I would not be surprised if that frost just smoked it. Uh, I'm sorry, Lindsay. <laughs> um, but yeah, right. for for any of our perennial forages, there are more frost tolerant than millet. Um, but yeah, usually that damage isn't going to show up for a couple of days. Um, we had a mild frost. I, I'm based near Lindsay, Ontario. We had a mild frost here, so I would not be surprised to see a little bit of burn on leaf margins from that. Um, I know it got a little colder in some other parts of the province. So in alfalfa, we might see some stems bending over. They call it like a shepherd's crook is the classic description because it just kind of Whoop, falls over and then it sometimes will straighten back up if the frost isn't too bad. Um, I haven't seen many locations except maybe a couple spots in northern Ontario that got a severe frost. In that case, alfalfa stems may have died back a little more so we might see a delay in, in the regrowth there. But um, no, for most of the southern parts of the province, it looks like the frost was pretty mild so probably going to be superficial damage. Pete, are you going to give me better news than Christine? Yeah, so it's a grass, right? How deep did you plant it? The growing point <laughs> is likely still below ground if it's only at the two leaf stage. But That's the hope. problem is that it's a stupid warm season grass that doesn't like I cold know. temperatures. And and the vigor, even even if it survives, it may have it may have uh, really impacted the vigor. And it might not. I doubt it's dead just because it's a grass. If it's only at the two leaf stage, now you sh it's, you probably planted it pretty shallow because it's millet and it can't go three inches yeah. deep and right. And it was dry. so, so right. Well, so if yeah. it's dry, you maybe went a little deeper to find moisture. I'm not sure, yeah. but anyway, uh, the growing point is likely still below ground. I expect with a light frost, you're okay. But as Christine says, you it, it's all about monitoring it and. And with a grass like that, man, if you don't see some good regrowth, certainly within three or four days with good temperatures, just start over. It's a warm season grass. Just tell Chris not to not to get it of himself again and drive on. We don't need we don't need to encourage that. 
So I just I feel like we are finally getting somewhere. Anyway, okay. Um, all right, that's that's sort of what I'm thinking. And but definitely, you know, more of the concern right now is, of course, wheat that um, is potentially, you know, at a at a delicate stage with heading. And then, of course, our soybeans and our corn. Definitely a lot of corn around here. Now I'm in the Ottawa Valley. We had two nights of frost. Uh, just a bit further from here, they did have a third night than it. The night before we got frost, they had frost. So there are some places that had three nights of a light frost. We only had the two. And the second night was not as bad as the first. So there's some, I think there's going to be some sad faces in a day or two when we see the full brunt of it, unfortunately. Yeah, so I, I really, I think we dodged the bullet. Uh, I doubt your wheat is far, your winter wheat, I doubt is far enough along that it, the head was actually exposed. If the head's exposed, then... It, it's pretty sensitive, mm -hmm. but most of the area where it got cold enough to do damage, a lot of the crop, the wheat is still just in the boot. And so in the boot, it'll take minus two, minus two for two hours. So that's a fair little bit of frost. Uh, if, if you're seeing your soybeans dead, because they take minus two, and I know out your way, soybeans on muck are in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I know that there's some some uh, wheat leaves, some spring wheat leaves that are quite damaged on muck soil. So on really frost prone areas, you might have some some injury. But uh, I, I think other than you get to up into northern Ontario, man, she's all bad up there. And I know there's bad news in, in Manitoba. But for the mm -hmm. vast majority of the winter wheat crop in Ontario, I think we dodged the bullet. Uh, I'm going to stick to that until I see signs otherwise. All right. Um, somehow you made this about wheat, Pete. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. I brought it up. It's fine. Yeah, I knew it. it was, it's a scam. Okay, so I do. we do want to talk nutrients, of course. Um, I do want to go over some of, you know, some of the rules of thumb or what you really need to think of depending on your crop. But Christine, tell me about what you're hearing on magnesium right now. Is that one of the ones that you're surprised to hear about? Yeah, so I've been hearing chatter from agronomists, and I'm sure I'm sure Pete's going to weigh in because they've been saying that there's magnesium deficiencies showing up in wheat. I haven't been walking wheat fields. I have no idea. Sure. Um, but they're also saying that there's low magnesium in grasses. So no one has sent me a forage analysis. Uh, I haven't seen any tissue tests, nothing. And it surprises me that people want to talk about magnesium this year because the conditions are not what we would typically see for um, grass techni or staggers. And it's it's a weird one because it's only agronomists that I'm hearing talk about this. I'm not hearing anything from the livestock side. So I kind of just wonder if agronomists are entertaining themselves with like, what about magnesium deficiency? Um, but yeah, we can we can talk a bit about that because I'm, I'm only hearing it on the crop side. I'm not hearing anything on the livestock side, which is odd for something like that. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not the year I would have expected magnesium to come up on grass. So Pete, yeah. why why do we have to talk about magnesium? Well, so what's really astounding to us is that the tissue samples are coming back low magnesium. And they've been coming back low magnesium all the way since we started sampling in April. And some of them have gotten a little bit better, but it, it hasn't bounced back the way that you would normally expect it. And we're actually, Christine, we're all sort of scratching our head saying, what about this year? Like, why this year are those grasses coming back low magnesium? And by the way, we're not seeing deficiency symptoms, at least very rarely if we are, but we're seeing low tissue magnesium. And mm -hmm. so from that standpoint, you just, you just kind of back up and say, well, it, we had a great March, things were really growing fast. And then we hit cold weather in April and May and dry weather. And so with the dry weather, you know, generally magnesium moves it in, with the water in the soil. All of a sudden there's very little water being able to move because there's not much water there to move. And so maybe that rapid growth used up the available ma magnesium and, and there just hasn't, the plant hasn't been able to access the, the added magnesium. We have a few guys who've tried some plots. One really neat one in central Ontario where the grower applied a, a whack of dolmitic limestone last year before he planted his winter wheat. And his pH is 7, 8. 
and you go like, what is the matter with you, Norm? Why did you put on Dalmitic limestone on a pH of 7, 8? Are you insane? But he did it for the magnesium. Mm -hmm. And that, that particular field is really staying very dark green and, and just looks more vigorous then his other fields didn't do that. Now, unfortunately, it's not a side-by-side -side comparison and there's so many, like you can't really take anything from it, but it, it is a real quandary. About 80% of all the tissue samples coming back, both in Ontario and Michigan, are low magnesium. And that's just weird compared to normal. And these are wheat tissue samples you're talking? Yeah, so wheat tissue samples, but there's a, been a few hay samples as well that have all okay. come, also come back low magnesium. Uh, I don't deal as much with, with hay tissue samples, and I wouldn't actually deal with that many wheat tissue samples, but Joanna Fallings, your, your counterpart, right, your cereal specialist, Christine, is part of this Yen program, and suddenly we're pulling all these tissue samples, and so we're seeing things that, that it's kind of kind of making us scratch our heads. It's, it's a bit of fun, though. Uh, do we need magnesium on on alfalfa crops or forage crops? Yeah, if if they if the soil test is low, then probably we do. But on average, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Yeah, uh, I I'm not even sure if uh, yeah if it needs to be the big thing. So the reason this is surprising me is like normally when we have a wet year, that's when we're more likely to see grass tetany. So often if you just do a quick internet search for grass tetany, usually the extension articles will say in brackets, hypomagnesia, which means low magnesium levels in the animal's blood. And it's not a simple magnesium deficiency. Like researchers have tried to study grass tetany or staggers by feeding cattle a diet that's completely balanced, except doesn't have enough magnesium. And they get magnesium deficiency, they don't get staggers. Like staggers, mm -hmm. um, as a characteristic, they, they paddle with their feet like in the last stages before they die. And it's, it's an awful way to go. We don't want staggers in our <laughs> livestock. Um, yeah. But we normally, yeah, we normally see that in a wet year when there's a lot mm -hmm. of potassium moving away from the soil particles into the soil water. It's, it's a lot of cation interactions because potassium and magnesium and calcium are all cations that are kind of the same size and they do wacky things where they switch out for each other. So basically your vet will diagnose grass tetany by low magnesium levels in the blood, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated with those interactions. So because this isn't a wet year, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have seen more potassium maybe go out on some of those forage fields than we typically do. There was a lot of fertilizer moving onto hay and pasture fields this year, more than, than normal. Um, but we just don't have the conditions and I'm not hearing anything on the livestock side. So while it is a puzzle on the wheat, why magnesium might be lower, I don't think it's an issue on our forages this year. I've, I've had a couple of agronomists ask me, but like, no, I'm... I, like, until I hear something, if you're a vet or you're a livestock producer and you've got an Please issue with call. staggers this year, yeah. shoot me an email. I want to know. <laughs> but yeah, no, go. until I hear something from the livestock set, I'm not worried. It'll be really so, interesting to see the magnesium levels in the forage samples as we get yeah. hay harvest underway, right? Like that, to me, yeah. that'll be cool. But uh, yeah, yes. don't rush out um, and put magnesium on your hay. Yeah, please don't. Test but it, it Yeah, but it does bring up a... I mean, you did mention that you did see a, a lot more, you noticed an uptick in fertilizer going out onto hay fields. Do you think that was in anticipation of perhaps a drier year, farmers wanting to push that, that tonnage a little bit to make sure that crop's got what it needs? Very possibly. Um, and even just, yeah, we've, we've had a few years where inventories have been tight and I think producers are really trying to be proactive this year and, and, you know, pay attention to the fertility, do what they can to make sure they're going to get the yield that they need. So that was really what was driving um, those fertilizer applications, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I'm I'm going to ask, and we do actually have clips that at some point I will get to. And uh, Vern did send a really nice question about pasture mixes or forage mixes that we will get to. Um, but I did want to also mention, um, because we're talking nutrients i'm gonna ask about when is the best time to put on fertilizer so i'm gonna give the scenario when you guys tell me so i've got a i've got a second or third year alfalfa mix about 50 percent alfalfa the rest is grasses do i put it all on before as it greens up do i put it on after first cut when should i if i'm only gonna apply fertilizer once when should i do it so 
when it comes to winter hardiness for your alfalfa, it really needs enough potassium in time for that fall rest period so that it can go through that hardening off process properly and it has the nutrients it needs. So the best bang for your buck is going to be to get that potash on before the start of the fall rest period, like within the month to six weeks before that starts. So the start date varies depending on where you are in the country, um, but your provincial um, forage specialist, provincial ag department, they'll have a map that tells you when your start date should be. Um, so yeah, any time in the month or six weeks before that start date, if you can get the potash on then, and then obviously it's more economical to apply the phosphate at the same time. So that would be your one shot. Okay. Pete? So I would say, are you keeping that stand? And what grass is it? You said it's 50% grass. And mm -hmm. how much do you want to push the grass? Like, are we only talking phosphorus and potash? Or are we actually short hay and we need to promote some grass growth in that first cut. And so, you know, if you're using a useless grass like Timothy. Timothy. Then I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Not on this farm. Anyway. <laughs> no, so it, like if you have a grass that doesn't give good regrowth, then and you're going to push grass production, the nitrogen needs to go on for first cut. If you have a grass like orchard grass and you get moisture, then, you know, maybe delaying that and trying to promote some, some second growth is a possibility. But with one shot, if it is nitrogen, it's probably first cut. So we're going to do it early. And if it's uh, just phosphorus and potash and, and that alfalfa stand is primarily what you're after, then I agree with Christine. You put in the fall and try and promote winter hardiness. But you, you, you need to know, like, how long is the stand staying? If this is the last year for it, then we're pushing it early and trying to get every bale we can out of it this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just so you know, my handy dandy producer and workmates have let me know that apparently there's a hockey game on tonight and the Leafs are losing <laughs> to everyone's surprise. And Kara is shocked. I don't have the game on in the background, but only one host <laughs> does that. And it's Sean. So there you go. Okay. Um, good question, though. I do want to, Sean wants to know about manure and forage. So we will get to that one. Uh, but before we go to our first clip, and it's going to be, as we talked about that alfalfa stand, we're going to go to a clip with uh, Glenn Friesen from 2013. Can't wait to get there. But before we go to that, uh, Varen wants to know the ultimate forage mix. He doesn't say what it's for or where you are. So assume it's in your own backyard. <laughs> what is... What is, and I guess Lindsay's, thanks for the shout out there, bud. Um, ultimate forage mix. What are you feeding? Like, there you go. <laughs> what are you feeding? Um, yeah. And the other thing I guess is like when producers ask me about a forage mix, first of all, I ask them kind of what soil type they're growing it on. So like the only species I give a, a out of the box standard mix to is horses. Cause when you're trying to sell that, you need the, the thing that is marketable but for our ruminants what's going to persist they're not fussy eaters they're, they can adapt to almost anything so what's going to grow well in that that soil type and drainage so i i don't have enough information to answer your question <laughs> that's okay that but that starts our list of here are the things to consider when choosing your forage mix okay pete do you have an ultimate forage mix oh yeah so for hay it's it's alfalfa orchard grass abs oh yeah no sean i'm not yeah, gonna say no. wheat for wheat not a as a forage, forage. crop wheat <laughs> is a grain forage. crop yeah. Terrible for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean if you want to go down that road then it's it's rye we'll take cereal rye as a forage crop right that's, or triticale yeah. for that matter but no a, a mm -hmm. perennial forage gosh it's it's to me a perennial forage for hay is is definitely alfalfa orchard grass or maybe tall fescue if you don't like orchard grass. So some grass that's actually decent at productivity. And if it's pasture, man, you just got to love white, like Ladino clover or white clover. And and again, one of those good grasses like like tall fescue or orchard grass or something in that range because because they will keep on producing. And stick a bottom grass in that pasture mix, something that's going to form sod, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, creeping red fescue, just to, to carry that traffic and keep the weeds out because you're keeping a pasture usually longer than you keep a hay field. So mm -hmm. yeah. creeping red. Fescue. I like creeping red. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. And uh, and sheep eat it. Um, <laughs> Varen says I'm feeding my wallet by selling it, in which case Christine's comment about horse hay. 
Of hey, course. If you right? make horse gotta day, look, it's like gotta be a 50 50 deal, Father Timothy. If you really want to yeah. push the grasses on it, you could throw in some orchard grass or some brome or something. Um, and I, I, I agree yeah. with you, Pete. I mean, Timothy front loads its yield. So it's not a productive grass yeah. over the whole season, but it is something that that market looks for. They love those fuzzy Timothy heads. Yeah. It's very yeah. soft yeah. green color. So that, that's something that market looks for. They're, it's a they're pets. They're pets. And pets get special food. It's not <laughs> hay burners. All there is to it. Exactly. Okay. All right. I do it. Let's talk about because somehow this is the long journey to clips. Um, we did talk about, of course, persistence and keeping alfalfa growing and, and what you want to do with it. But I did want to talk about establishment because this is always one of those questions. So uh, we're going to go to the clip of Glenn from 2013 um, on whether or not to choose a nurse crop. So for establishing alfalfa, I mean, seeding dates preferably, our, our target is to have a cool conditions with uh, lots of moisture. What that does is limit the transpiration through the little plant and gives them the best chance to survive. That's usually in spring. Uh, we do seed uh, in summer as well and in fall. If those conditions are there in summer and fall, that we do we do support those types of seeding dates uh, but by, by far and large we get most of that in spring so that's why we recommend spring seeding dates it also gives you the uh, the most time within that, that growing season to get a lot of yield out of it and most bang for your buck um, what we talk about for nurse crops is really it's 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 there's two different camps out there uh, using nurse crops is a positive if you have poor soil surface conditions like saline areas or sodic soils that are kind of crusting uh, or if you've got a lot of intense heat uh, in, in dry, dry conditions where the little seedlings might actually dry out and so the canopy from nurse crop will protect it uh, somewhat. So in those areas we do recommend a nurse crop. Um, however, we always recommend taking your nurse crop off early. A, uh, a maximum of, uh, of 60 days of growth uh, is preferred and if you can get the swath off in the form of baleage uh, quickly within three days uh, or swath or swath it off dry green feed within three days uh, that's preferred that allows the stand underneath to, to, to not be smothered out and uh, give you the best chance for a, a good uh, crop or cut after that. When deciding whether or not to use a nurse crop if you don't have the uh, soil conditions that you don't think are necessary to improve your alfalfa establishment um, we recommend actually not using them. Most of the high quality hay producers in Manitoba don't use nurse crops uh, nor do the dairy producers. Uh, what we're after in those areas is the, amount, the highest amount of energy harvested per acre and I think that should be the key for any producer uh, of, of hay, hay in Manitoba. Um, and with that said, uh, we get the highest energy per acre when not using a nurse crop. Nurse crops provide a lot of bulk. Uh, it's a good way to, produ to produce fiber, uh, but there are cheaper sources of fiber in most years. And so um, I really challenge producers to consider uh, taking a different look at using nurse crops or producing uh, what's called beef quality hay. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of efficiency to be gained by feeding high quality hay with your beef herd and substituting some uh, straw or lower quality fiber feeds uh, at a cheaper cost. Okay, and if we establish in the spring, how long till we can harvest? Uh, typically, uh, when you seed in spring, we're looking to harvest within within 60 days. I think you want to give your uh, your stand a, enough opportunity to establish those roots. Uh, just depends. I mean, it depends on the growing conditions, uh, whether it's dry or moist or hot or cool. Uh, there are years where we're waiting a lot longer to actually get a, a cut off that uh, hay crop. Okay, and heading in uh, year of establishment, what do you like to see heading into winter to uh, improve winter hardiness? Uh, for alfalfa, namely high potassium in the soil, it'll help for, for overwintering. It's essentially the antifreeze of the plant, uh, so make sure you're, you're fertilizing well enough for that. Uh, leave yourself some stubble, uh, a minimum of four inches to catch snow, and, and this is why in some areas people prefer to use nurse crops because they're, they're certain to get some stubble out of from that. And, um, and uh, if you're fall seeding, uh, make sure you have at least uh, six weeks of growth in your legumes and three weeks of growth of your grasses uh, under good conditions uh, to ensure that that crown is perennialized and ready for the winter. Ah, oh, my buddy Glenn. I miss him. I haven't seen him in a long time. Um, also, I can hear my Manitoba accent in that one because that's when I was still living in Manitoba. 
And uh, so, yeah, you're welcome, everybody, for that little blast from the past. Um, okay, so I, I think I know where both of you pretty much stand on this question of nurse crop or no nurse crop. But let's go over it and let's go with why and when you would. So, Christine, maybe I'll start with you. If I'm going to establish alfalfa in the spring, do I put a nurse crop? So I think this is kind of where the climate differences between Manitoba and Ontario are coming out. Because Glenn's like, if it's dry, use a nurse crop. And I would say no. I got calls last year where producers, they used a nurse crop. They took off the cereals as silage. They thought everything looked great. They came back a week later. I'm getting phone calls. Where's my alfalfa? How come How come there's no alfalfa there? And the reason is the cereals will always outcompete that perennial crop for, for, or for moisture. For moisture and nutrients, if any of those things are limiting, the cereals are just more competitive. So you could use a nurse crop in the spring if you're hurting for forage and you're anticipating you're going to get the water that you need. That would be the only time I would say to use it. Uh, summer seeding can't can't really guarantee that moisture that's that's pretty risky I, I wouldn't do it then ever mm -hmm. um but yeah only if you're hurting for feed because that crop will establish a lot better if it's not trying to fight against the cereals okay pete yeah why why bother man you want alfalfa so blessed expense that you, that's the key and as soon like uh, it's called, uh, they call it a nurse crop. It doesn't nurse anything but itself. It's a weed to the alfalfa crop. It impedes the alfalfa crop's establishment. There's all, there's tons of research that support you want good forage. You, you direct seed alfalfa, you can seed it at the right then you're not trying to to make a compromise b between how deep do I seed the OPs and how the, that's too deep for the alfalfa. Well, if I seed the alfalfa right, it's too deep for the oats and or it's too shallow for the oats and peas. Ah, gosh, Jim, you want alfalfa? Seed alfalfa. Have a nice day. And if you're short forage, figure out a different way to get get more for so plant cereal rye or triticale or something after your silage comes off and take that off for your early forage uh, i think i think there's better way to deal with it and, and by the way i'm a hundred percent with christine if you're dry and you put a nurse crop with that alfalfa that's that's just a recipe for disaster baby like the, it it leaves no moisture for the alfalfa it's uh, yeah yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, the other one I hear is like, oh, well, I want the nurse crop to suppress the weeds. If it's actually seeded thick enough to suppress weeds, what is that doing to the lifetime yield potential of your alfalfa? Like, right. No. Yeah. It is and, now and the and weed. It, Guess what? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that exactly. It's going to suppress a lot, including what you actually want to grow. So, yeah, definitely one of those things that needs to... Uh, maybe move on i think it's kind of tradition right so i'm not sure where the nurse crop thing came from where you know where it became so popular but uh, definitely seems to be something that we we need to move on from unless like you said you know in a really tight feed situations maybe you do need that cut but pete this is one of the things that i've certainly noticed and christine i'm sure you're getting lots of calls about this as ontario farmers are growing more cover crops they're using more you know they're they're keeping their soil covered they're planting you know cereal rye in the fall there are opportunities to take a cut in the spring or do some spring grazing or fall grazing these sorts of things so much more i'm seeing so much more of it through social media and that sort of stuff and it's i mean it's a probably you're right a much better solution Oh Lord help us this year. It's like a gift. It's a gift yeah. this year because we got an early start and in that crop, if you fertilize that triticale or, or rye crop or whatever early, you got a tremendous yield from it. And the stupid thing came off mid May or in that range, it was dry. You didn't beat the soil up and now we've got moisture. So it, it's like a gift. It's free forage. Uh, it doesn't work that way every year, by the way. Sometimes when it's ready to come off, it's pouring rain. And uh, so, so don't now, don't think that uh, it always works that way. But now we've got moisture. Geez, you must be west of Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
exactly. Yeah, Let's not everybody has me on that one. Not yeah. everybody got we're, moisture, unfortunately. Yeah, no. we're we're pretty dry. But I will say, Pete, to your point, um, on the field that we put the millet in, this spring we kicked ourselves for not having put cereal rye last fall because we would have had some pretty amazing early season growth that we could have probably had the sheep on. So, um, but again, it doesn't always work that way. So if only we knew we were going to have this spring, we could have done something like that, but Hey, all right. Um, Sean, who loves agronomy, it's his favorite topic and he loves forages even more. Um, Sean wants us to talk about manure on forages, which I actually, this was on my list. So I will use his comment as a segue and he'll probably update us on the game as well. Um, but favorite type of manure on forages i'm gonna twist it around a little my question was walk me through the process of type of manure and stage of forage when am i applying so i'll start with your typical dairy situation christine when would i try to get that manure on my forage stand if i'm dealing with dairy Okay, so dairy operation, we're talking liquid manure, we're also talking haylage. So that crop is being cut and taken out of the field probably within two days, right? That's pretty fast, that's perfect. We can get out there, we can get that manure on, um, ideally some sort of dribble bar. You could inject it, but you don't wanna go too deep with the injectors because you can damage some alfalfa crowns there. So you wanna stay pretty shallow if you're injecting. But yeah, you can get liquid manure out very quickly after a haylage harvest. And that's great because once those plants start to regrow, that trample damage, anywhere where those wheel tracks are, they're gonna be set back compared to the rest of the field. So quality in the yield tracks, a little higher because stage of development, little little less mature. So it, it just, it keeps things nice and even if you can get in there in less than five days and in a haylage system, that's easy. Okay, Pete, for you, we're gonna talk composted maybe from a sheep barn or a beef pack something like that because i know they're your favorite um where when does that fit in the growth cycle and when should i be trying to get some composted some drier manure out on the field yeah so as soon as we talk dry manure now i'm multiple trips over the field like it tends to be a little bit tougher not to do the tramp damage if you could as Christine says if you could get that out within a couple of days uh, after that first harvest but but normally you're not as much nitrogen in the compost not as much readily available and so probably we're going to do that in the fall and we're going to look at that compost as a uh, a slow release nitrogen for the next year's crop and it's going to bring some potash for sure to the table some phosphorus for sure to the table and and the big thing the other thing that i think you have to be careful of anytime you talk about dry manure uh, you know you don't want to get into yanni's coming in, in into the forage uh, through the feed and so doing it in the fall and not harvesting it until the next the next spring really helps reduce that that concern and you have to do the super job of spread pattern, right? Uh, and and you said composted, Lindsay, so that makes it a lot easier. If I'm a, a you know beef farmer with with pack manure and I'm taking it right out of the barn, trying to tear that stuff apart, or or horse manure, like it's so straw, trying to tear that apart and and getting a nice thin uniform spread gets really tough. And so again, then I think uh, fall application is probably when I'm going to do that. And I did have a question a um, couple weeks ago with someone who had, let's, I wouldn't say it was composted manure, but it was relatively well aged dry manure. And they were putting it on ahead of this year's corn crop. They had ground that they were putting in and wanted to know if there'd be any sort of credit to any sort of fertility credit. So my assumption would be all of that is kind of slow release. It would probably take a while. I wouldn't give it much, but what's the, what's the actual response? Because that was a guess. Yeah, so so dry manure put on a corn crop and then the credit to that in the next year's forage crop? Is that the question, Lindsay? No, no, or like the manure itself, would it feed the corn crop at all that year? So if you're putting yeah, on so pretty it all, dry, yeah. So what's the carbon to nitrogen ratio? How much straw is in it? So if it's horse yeah. manure, then it's, it's actually going to tie nitrogen up. Bring some potash to the table, assuming we get some moisture. It'll bring some phosphorus, micronutrients, all those things. It'll stimulate biological activity. There's lots of good things. 
But if you have a carbon nitrogen ratio that's over 30 to one, because you're using really straw manure, either beef pack or, or out of a, a horse, then it will actually be a negative to the nitrogen because the soil bugs are going to try to break it down and they have to use added nitrogen to get there. And, and so you don't, you can't actually predict whether it will provide nitrogen or tie up nitrogen without a carbon to nitrogen ratio. And it's one of the things that Christine Brown, who's the uh, uh, nutrient management lead with the Ministry of Agriculture, wishes more people would do is actually get a carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, an, in their manure analysis so they, they know where this kind of shakes out. Okay. Now, Christine, you mentioned in uh, in leading up to the show, we went back and forth with some questions and topics, and you made a comment about potash, about K and alfalfa, and in linking that with milk fever. So, what is what is that whole question that's going on right there? What's that about? Yeah. So, often when I get an alfalfa sample come in, if there's any nutrient that's deficient, it's going to be potassium, and some of this comes from the dairy sector where they're being very, very careful not to induce milk fever in their cows. So because this is an agronomy show, I'll give you the one on 101 on milk fever. Basically, when a cow is very pregnant, before she calves, she's pretty low nutrient demand, but the amount of calcium that her body needs to put into milk production after she calves is extremely high. It's so high that she cannot get all that calcium from her diet alone. So because she can't get it all from her diet, basically her metabolism can crash if we don't prep that cow properly for calving so that her body is ready for this, this intense calcium demand. So the way nutritionists and dairy farmers set up the cows for success is they feed them a diet that is low in calcium and low in potassium because we're getting back into that wacky cations replacing each other thing again. Right. Um, we, so we need a low cation diet so that the cow's body starts to pull calcium out of her bones into her bloodstream. And if she's already doing that, then when she calves, they can switch her to a high calcium diet. She's already, she's already pulling calcium from her bones. And so she'll have enough total calcium to put into the milk and she's not gonna crash, she'll be fine. So because dairy farms need forages that are low in calcium and low in potassium, sometimes this gets, pushed a little bit too far and they're very scared to put any K on alfalfa at all for fear of causing milk fever by having a high, high K forage in the ration. So um, there are a few different strategies that farms could use to avoid this, but I recognize, you know, most people specialize, you either specialize in plants or you specialize in animals. So as if you're an agronomist, you're working with a dairy client, you're trying to get them to fertilize their alfalfa properly, make sure it has enough potassium. The strategy I would encourage you to suggest, because you'll never talk down the nutritionist without knowing something about dairy nutrition. Um, the strategy I propose to you is encourage them to say, okay, let's take one field, let's set it aside for dry cow forage, let's store it separately from the rest of the forages. So you can mine the K out of that field and you won't have an issue with milk fever and you can fertilize the rest of the farm properly to promote that winter hardiness, to promote that stand longevity. That's probably the simplest um, solution to pitch as the agronomist without a dairy nutrition background. There are some other strategies, but um, they, they require a bit more knowledge on the animal side. So that's probably the easiest one to, to suggest to clients, particularly if um, you're, not, you're not the nutritionist. Right. Nutritionists really? are very smart. Yes. <laughs> but also so I wanted very, to add- Very it is, specialized. It, yes, it is, but it's a great, uh, you explained it incredibly well. And the way my dairy instructor explained it, you have to prime the pump. Kind of idea right you have to prime their system to be pulling that calcium out of their bones so same idea you prime it and then away you go um very cool i've i've never really heard it framed in that way so that is uh that's kind of cool i did want to talk about we have some pictures and of course the journey to the next clip but i want to talk about leaf hoppers because this is i think always an issue in alfalfa um maybe that's generalizing but that's fine but where are we at right now, as far as in Ontario anyway, what are we seeing as far as levels? So I haven't seen any yet, 
but we also haven't had any of those summer storms blowing up in from the states but that could happen at any time so like mm -hmm. leaf hopper watch starts now we're heading into june <laughs> they may already be here um but leaf hoppers we see them across a lot of the province and most of the time they get mistaken for drought people people look at that and go oh no it's it's turning yellow it's wilting but it's hot it's summertime i think i think it's just dry that that alfalfa doesn't have enough water i'm just i'm gonna wait for it to rain and it's 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 a very common misdiagnosis but it it kills me when the field next to it is corn that's not spiky and pineappling or it's you know soybeans that look green and happy like alfalfa established alfalfa has a massive taproot it can reach so far down in soil profile this is going to be the last crop to hurt for moisture if it hasn't rained you know except maybe sorghum sedan grass but warm season grasses are a whole other thing so out of out of our commonly grown field crops like alfalfa is not going to show that moisture stress as early as some of those annuals will so if you're seeing this kind of yellowing and bronzing um Go check for leaf poppers. Get a sweep net and start taking a look. Um, that the picture that we've got up on screen right now is sort of the early symptoms. That's the classic hopper burn. That that V shaped on the tips. Once it gets more progressed, then it's it's yellowing and, and bronzing of the leaves, and it it could be you know an, any number of things once it's much more advanced. But um, if you catch it at that point, that's kind of the classic sign that you've got leaf hoppers. But uh, a sweep net will tell everything. Right. And Pete, this is one of the things that definitely we get questions every year for Wheat Pete's Word. Every year we get questions about it. What um, what advice do you have for exactly that, the scouting? When should we be scouting for leaf hoppers? Yeah, so so first off, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we do have leaf hoppers that have moved in because last weekend, Everybody wanted to be out spraying. Nobody could spray because she was just gale force winds. We didn't have the rain, which often is what brings those leaf hoppers. But man, it was just fiercely windy. And I'm seeing ladybugs in wheat fields now. And ladybugs in wheat fields don't show up in wheat fields if there's not aphids. And we really didn't have aphids to speak of until just the last maybe four or five days. And so the aphids likely came with some of those winds. There might've been some around, but but probably we're, we're seeing more of those insects showing up. So I think it's time to scout now, but you really wanna scout after first cut, or if you have new direct seeding, because if you, you think about the, the leaf hopper, it's essentially like a mosquito on the plant. It sucks out the, the juices, but then as it pulls its proboscis out, just like the mosquito, when it's pulling out of your arm, it leaves behind some, some compounds that make you react and then you're itchy. Well, in a plant, the leafhopper puts proteinaceous compounds inside the, the, the uh, conductive tissue. And so that's why we get the hopper burn because now the nutrients can't translocate. And if you stop the translocation of nutrients on little wee alfalfa, then mm -hmm. it'll never recover. Like it just, it can't. Whereas if you get big alfalfa that's five or 10 days away from cutting, man, it can handle a ton of leaf hopper. So the threshold changes based on size. And it's some ridiculous thing like, like uh, one leaf hopper in 10 sweeps or something like that, or one in five sweeps, I forget exactly. When it's four inches or less, 10 centimeters or, or less alfalfa, or uh, the other thing, of course, is that that new seeded, direct seeded alfalfa, even if you have a leaf hopper resistant variety, they don't express in that first year. And so if you can't get new nutrients to the roots to build up a good crown and really get that alfalfa well established, it will affect the production of that plant for its entire life. So there's there's those two really critical periods that you just want to get out there and scout. And if you have them, you control them. That's just all there is to it. Uh, Jason Vogt wants to know, is this the same species of leaf hopper that causes leaf tip burn in dry beans or edible beans as well? Is it the same one? Yes. Yep. Potato leaf yeah. hopper does the same thing in potatoes. It's uh, I'm sure there's other leaf hoppers out there, but the, the problematic one in alfalfa is the same as in dry beans is the same as in potatoes. Okay. Um, 
I was going to say, it's probably one of those dumb ones that we call a potato leaf hopper and doesn't attack potatoes. But I am glad to hear that it also <laughs> yes. attacks potatoes. So the name makes sense. Um, but, I mean, it's a good question because, of course, we have cereal aphids and then we have soybean aphids, right? So we, we do have species-specific ones there. But So this one's just bad all around. Okay. Um, and there are... Question, follow-up question. There are insecticide options for leafhopper on alfalfa there is but cutting cutting is your first choice so yeah if you are close enough to harvest or if the population is really high if you cut you're doing two things first of all you're actually saving the forage you've got and secondly you're taking away the leafhopper's food source so that really is our our best option because you're gonna have great control of your leafhoppers and it's not gonna really affect those beneficial insects that are out in that hay field. Um, mm -hmm. But you want to scout again. So keep scouting every five to seven days, particularly after you take that cut. And if you hit over threshold, then an insecticide might be needed to control that population. Okay. So so the worst sort of time is if it's like, say, a long way from being harvested and you've got really high numbers, that would be the worst yeah. scenario. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, uh, that sounds good. All right. Do you guys, do you want to talk about supercharging the the forage crop or do you want to talk about staging cutting because we if this is we're not going to get to all three clips so this is going to be a choose your own adventure what do you think christine do you want to talk about the peak stick and talk about first cut or cutting alfalfa in general what do you think or you i want to supercharge it I, I i'm leaning towards supercharging are... actually uh, yes, yeah come I on I, it's i don't have anything new on the peak stick let's talk supercharging okay all right. For anyone who doesn't know, the peak stick is a really cool stick that you just, you know, you can walk us through it, Christine. You measure the height of the alfalfa plant and you find the stage and it gives you an indication of quality, right? Yeah. Those things are well yeah. correlated in alfalfa. They're not well correlated in grasses, but yeah, we've, we've got a fact sheet on peak sticks. Cool. Shoot me an email. I'll send that out. out. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Jay, producer Jay, that means we want to hear from Grant and supercharging our forest crop. If we treat it as a crop of value, it really does pay the bills. And the opportunities are great. And a lot of that is exciting. Mm -hmm. As I guess that's why we've got Viagra in that title. <laughs> it's exciting to see what we can achieve when we actually look at something differently. And so when we look at it as a crop of value, how do we keep that value? How do we create that value? We get value. And we get value all the way from the pocketbook through to the forage, to the soil health, to the consumer that uses our products. So it's exciting. Mm -hmm. What what kind of data, I guess, has, has been shown in regards to keeping track of your own data uh, in the long term? The data overall, when it gets down to forages, it lacks information. What we're looking at is trying to get more accurate uh, data. And a lot of it isn't sold. It's used on farm, uh, be it hay, be it pasture, other things. So it gets left without the answers it really needs. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the data coming from it in tons per acre, animal days per acre, and start comparing it, all of a sudden we find that, wow, we got some real opportunities here and that we're not realizing. So let's take advantage of them and uh, use them to the fullest. Mm -hmm. And talk to me um, about ranchers kind of keeping keeping track and farmers keeping track of their data and, and to how to use that data that they have taken over the years uh, and really use it to their advantage. Well, it really is important to use records. Keep the records from a standpoint of comparison go ahead and try your best to look at it. And certainly AgriProfits at Alberta Agriculture does that for people with crops, with uh, beef production, with forages. And so they'd be glad to work with producers looking at the financial and the economic side of things. So how does it really add up? And with that in mind, it really starts with keeping track. Mm -hmm. And if we can keep track, and consistently, then we can compare, we can learn, we can apply science, 
and get more predictable results, more profit. Mm -hmm. Are there any examples uh, that you gave in your presentation? One of the things I find surprising is that we look at the opportunity from a laying a wide swath for haying and, and realize it's not taken advantage of like it should be because the ultraviolet rays of the sun and humidity are so crucial to dry down. Why do we want to let a plant use carbohydrates as it respires for an extra day or two days and using up the quality we could get, the value of a crop we could get? Well, lo and behold, we lay a wide swath. We have the potential to go ahead and within six, eight hours, get down to that 30, 40, 30% 30 moisture where in fact our plants are not respiring anymore, burning up sugars. We're saving a day or two on the way to making a hay that could be quality or making a silage for that matter. Mm -hmm. So using that data to be more precise and like you said, it will help, will help with your bottom line. Anything else that you'd like to uh, kind of share with farmers or ranchers? With forages, what we found over time, it really is synergy. And that's the exciting thing that has so many people so excited about forages and others wondering why. And I think that was what I stumbled onto when I first started, was at times things don't add up. And in ecological systems, in systems where we've got more perennial, we've got more environment, we've got management, we've got species, all of that translates into complexity. And yet within that complexity are some basic rules of thumb, some simple things and opportunities, if we look at it right, to really take advantage of a system and use it to our advantage. And the beauty of it in forages I find again and again is one plus one never ever equals two. So you gotta find that synergy. <laughs> You've got to find that synergy because the excitement that keeps us going and getting out of bed in the morning is not sustainable or regenerative. And opportunities, in fact, to talk to a consumer about we're growing soil health as we grow forages and we're growing animal health as we grow forages and healthy food products. Mm -hmm. That was the right choice. Well done. Um, so many, so many great things there that Grant that Grant talked about. That um, no wonder you must love your job, Christine, because unlike a boring crop like wheat, where it's just one crop, <laughs> you've got perennials, you've got multi species, you've got all these challenges, but you have no data. So how are you going to solve this problem, Christine? How? Oh, the the day I stop learning in this job is the day I quit, I tell you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, but Grant Grant really highlighted that we do have a lot of data gaps in these crops that we don't see in grains and oil seeds. And uh, one of the, the biggest data gaps really is in pasture because while he's right, most forage crops, even harvested forage crops grown in Canada, they're used on the farm where they're grown, they don't leave. But at least if you're hauling it out of the field, you know, you could run it over a way scale. You could stick a moisture tester in it. Like you can take a couple of quick measurements if you remember to do it while, while you're, you know, taking that crop off. Whereas pasture, I mean, the, I say sometimes the hardest thing about my job is that ruminants don't come with yield monitors. Like I really wish they did. Um, so I'm working with uh, one of my colleagues, James Barnes, is one of our, they don't, Lindsay, they don't come with yield hey. monitors. I have one. Um, okay, carrying on. <laughs> so I'm working with um, one of my colleagues, James Byrne, is one of OMAFRA's beef cattle specialists, and uh, some of the researchers at the University of Guelph, Dr. Kim Schneider, and, and one of her grad students. We're working on calibrating a rising plate meter for Ontario conditions. So it's a tool that's been used in a lot of countries that have, you know, grass based livestock sectors, um, but they tend to be rye grass based stands. So we're taking that tool, we're calibrating it for Ontario conditions because the calibration is usually the, the largest source of error so it's got to be a regional local calibration for this to work um, but we want to start getting that out on farm getting that into producers hands and taking a look at you know how fast is the grass growing how much grass have I got on my farm right now and making those those decisions about grazing management with a bit more data so you could think of this like the yield monitor equivalent 
for pasture. People successfully grew grain crops for thousands of years before yield monitors, but what farmer today can imagine buying a combine without a yield monitor? Like it doesn't happen. You want that basic information of what is my production so that you can drill down and go, okay, this field's yielding more, this field's yielding less. What do I do for fertility? What do I do for population? You know, zone specific, we're getting variable rate. Like all of that relies on a yield monitor. This is the pasture equivalent, but it goes one step further because we're not waiting till the end of the grazing season to get that data. If we're measuring every week, we're getting weekly updates of like, okay, is grass growth rate keeping up with animal demand? If it is, awesome. If it's exceeding animal demand, okay, can I take a paddock off for baleage, maybe to put that up for winter feed or to save for the summer slump? If it's not keeping up, I can see that coming down the road. It's not like I ran out of feed and went, oh no, <laughs> grass growth wasn't keeping up. I can see it coming two weeks, three weeks, a month out by looking at this data and say, okay, how am I going to manage this grazing to make sure I don't run out of grass? Am I going to add more acres to graze? Am I going to start supplemental feeding? Because by feeding proactively, we actually feed less than waiting till we run out of grass and feeding them just the stored forage. So like there's lots of management stuff you can do if you have that information ahead of time. So that's what we're working on. We're still going to need a couple years of data just because we want a really robust calibration. But uh, we are working towards that to get some of that data so that we can you know, have that grass growth rate, have more information to make those those decisions proactively instead of reactively. So in 2025, yield monitors on my sheep. Got it. Okay, that's what you <laughs> said, folks. You heard it here. <laughs> Close enough. Okay, um, that is great. We are running out of time. Jay has given me the, the little hand signal uh, virtually. But Pete, um, we do need to measure because you can't manage what you don't measure. We need to treat forages. I know they're not your wheat crop, but but what can farmers do to supercharge those forages? What are some of those basic things that we're not maybe doing as well as we could? Yeah, so so I really think that one of the things, and, and not every producer, but it was interesting that Christine talked about, about uh, milk fever and potash. Man, when I started this job way back when, like all the alfalfa had too much potash in it because dairy farmers had been drilled into their head that alfalfa needs potash and they pounded potash fertilizer on and then they got into all these animal health issues and they quit and the yields went way up and i am astounded at how many dairy farms that i walk on to today where their potash soil test levels are nowhere near where they should be and it's not everybody but but I, I really am surprised. So pot, uh, al, hay crops, forage crops are huge feeders, not only on potash, but also on phosphorus. And don't forget about sulfur. So this is one of the ones that, that has come to the table more recently. And when we first did that, that original work on sulfur was really interesting. If we added more potash, and didn't add sulfur, the added potash had a tendency, it wasn't statistically significant, but it was directly there that that potash would reduce the alfalfa yield, reduce the forage yield, not increase it. And so making sure that, that we, we fertilize appropriately, uh, a lot of growers don't want to use uh, uh, nitrogen at all. And if you have a grass, hay man in Europe, it's all rye grass based and it's all nitrogen fertilizer and they blow the doors off of us from a yield perspective. So I, I like, I think there's so much that we can do with fertility and that like we, we just aren't paying as much attention as maybe we should be, or at least some producers definitely are not. Well, and I, you know, if, if you complain about wheat, not getting the attention it deserves, let us introduce you to forages because oh my goodness they, i mean i look around where we are and you know this is i didn't grow up here but i've been living here now at, at several seasons and we have a lot of fields that are these one cut wonders that they have essentially the only management they get is to be cut once a year there's no added fertility there's no you know these sorts of things and and i guess if that's all you need that's what you do but realistically a forage crop can be a pretty amazing, amazing feed producer, but you got to manage it. 
and and that's the key is like if you if you go through the financial data on average on most of our ruminant farms feed accounts for about 60 percent of the expenses on that operation and we know from experience from research all around the world canada everywhere like well-managed forage is the cheapest source of feed but the keyword is well managed so yes there are crop inputs that go into that management but they're definitely going to pay for themselves in the long run. And it's sometimes hard for producers to see that because they're not getting paid for the forage crop. They're getting paid for meat. They're getting paid for milk. They're getting paid for wool. But if you can find those areas where you can really push the management on the forage crops, it means they're going to buy in less off farm produced feed, which is going to be more expensive than what they can grow themselves most of the time. So it really does help the bottom line to get those crop inputs in place. And, and really push that management. And, and, and you, get, I'll, you get the last word, Pete. So, so first off, I want to say, Christine said you get paid for wool? You actually <laughs> paid for wool? Man, when I had sheep, I had to pay the guy that sh was doing the shearing of the sheep more than the wool was worth. I'm telling you, that That's doesn't so work. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, no, so, so the one, the one, the one cut wonders, right? The if you would only fertilize those stupid things instead of getting a mediocre yield of crappy quality stuff because you don't cut it on time and it doesn't have good nutrient value because there's no nutrients in the soil because you haven't put any there for the last 5,000 years, <laughs> fertilize this stupid your yield will double and and at 10 cents a pound for, hey, you'll make more money than you ever knew existed. Like uh, this management thing, even on One Cut Wonders, it, we just have to get better. Absolutely. All right. That's everyone's goal for this year. All you agronomists out there with your clients, you're going to get them to fertilize their hay and their pasture ground. We didn't even really talk about pasture ground. Oh, my goodness. You think... We, we were going to talk game. about sheep pasture for We were going to, but what we happened. didn't. No, I'm sorry. I, I promised you know on Twitter I wouldn't let that happen. Yeah, next. And we're out of time. So you did it, Pete. You did it. All right. Christine O'Reilly, Peter Wheatgrass Johnson, thank you for joining me tonight. This has been a lot of fun. Um, to everyone who was commenting, I couldn't see them. So I'm going to assume you said wonderful things. I did see some of the comments about how great my guests are. Nothing really about me, but that's fine. Um, I have no idea what topic we're going to do next week. So you know what? Get your uh, suggestions in. Zip me an email. Uh, tweet me. Whatever it is. Let me know what you guys want to talk about next week. And yes, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Wheat Pete. Thanks for having awesome. me. Awesome. Have a great night. Uh